know some of you know quite a bit about it, and some of you may probably don't know that much about it. So uh, forgive me if, if it's a bit. Um, I start at the basics and work up as well, just to explain everything about uh, about cannabis generally and about the medical use of cannabis. And feel free, there's a small group, so feel free to interrupt as well if you like, or throw things or whatever you want. <laughs> so. Basically, the bit of his, uh, it's a bit small, but I don't want to talk to you, I'll talk you through it as well. So, um, the cannabis has been around for, for millennia, uh, for thousands of years. In fact, the first seeds of cannabis have been identified uh, as to being there before man, uh, from the part of, from China and uh, underneath the Himalayas. So, it was probably the plant started life uh, over in the Far East and then slowly, over several centuries, spread towards the West uh, to come into Africa and then Europe and then across the Atlantic to the United States and South America uh, over the last two or three hundred years. So it's got a very, very long history. And it's a, it's a very interesting history about cannabis, but... Um, oh, hang on a minute. Um, and so, I uh, can't talk more than two or three minutes on the history. Uh, but this, this is very early, this is 1500 BC, and though you won't, uh, hopefully, one of you will know that these are hieroglyphics, and those, some of those hieroglyphics um, mention cannabis. You have to take my word for it, because I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Couldn't say anything, but I'm concerned. And apparently this describes the use of a cannabis poultice as a suppository for pain, uh, related to menstrual cramping, and it's still used for menstrual cramping. And that was that's one of the earliest written descriptions of the use of cannabis. So it's got centuries and centuries of use. There's many, many other things I could go on for the whole talk on the history of cannabis, but there's a few little bits about it. I just put that in, that's again, that's 500 years BC, and that was just a description by that guy, I'm not going to pronounce his name. Uh, I just like the last bit. The Scythians enjoy it so much they howl with pleasure. Uh, so that, one, that was using vaped cannabis by putting it on a hot stone and inhaling the vapour. Uh, so that's another one example of its use. But then coming up to date, it was about the, the, this is the first guy, he's an, an Irish guy that lived in the UK and then went to live in Ireland and in uh, India and in the 1830s and he found that the local Indian community were using cannabis, the hemp, I'll come back to the difference in a minute, um, and they were using it as religious ceremonies, using it recreationally and using it for medicine as well. Um, and he thought there must be something in this and he brought the stuff back into the UK. So that was the first medical use in the UK. It was pretty well in the early 19th century. And it was sold as something called Squire's Extract until the early part of the last century. So it was, it was around 100 plus years. Um, and then this guy was said to be the father of medicine, William Osler. Again, in the, you can see his dates there. And he said it's the most satisfactory remedy. He was talking about migraine at the time. So it's got a very solid medical part. People tend to forget that as it sort of became in just the last few years a drug that was um, illegal and went out of fashion and if you used it you were anti-establishment and you were, it was a bit iffy. Um, it's all complete rubbish because up to the last 30 or 40 years it was, it was totally accepted as a medicine. It's only in the last 30, 40, 50 years that it's been a bit vilified as a medicine but it's got two and a half thousand year history where it was uh, well accepted. Um, and that's just a few little historical things to show that this was perfectly all right for children, for all sorts of uh, indications. It began to go out of fashion about the 1920s, 1930s when modern pharmaceutical medicine came along. The big drug companies began to produce their drugs and then a plant, a sort of herb if you like, became a bit unfashionable and people were starting to use what they, what they call proper medicine, your pharmaceutical medicine. And so it was beginning to be not used quite as much by the 1920s. Uh, but then, um, in the modern times, I'll come to the next slide, this guy came along. He's the big enemy of the whole thing, a guy called Harry Anslinger. Uh, he was the first commissioner in the, this, this American, and the thing called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And uh, for those who might know their modern history, uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was a parallel organization to the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was led by a guy called J. Edgar Hoover, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, he was pitching all the resources. So the FBI was growing bigger and bigger and bigger in the States, and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, its counterpart, was getting smaller and smaller. So Anslinger thought 
thought he'd better have a proper campaign simply to get more money into the federal bureau of narcotics. So he, he landed on uh, cannabis as being the enemy of the people, and he had a very successful campaign, in fairness to him. His PR, the original PR, and he involved a newspaper uh, magnets, and uh, they said that cannabis was uh, a thing that caused a lot of crime, a lot of uh, sexual problems. It was a very uh, racist campaign. It was anti-Mexican and anti-black. I mean, it's a lot of If you read some of the stuff that came out, uh, you wouldn't get away with it anyway these days. It was an appalling campaign, but nevertheless, it was very successful. And because of America's influence in culture, the, the enemy of cannabis uh, became widespread around the globe, basically, as a result of this fellow. We, we formed our company, and we formed a teaching institute recently to teach people about cannabis, and we thought, well, ironically, we called it the Anslinger Institute. Um, <laughs> It was sort of irony, but the, the power of social media showed me there's so many people who wrote and said, you can't call it the Anson Institute, uh, because he was that horrible guy, and they missed the irony of the whole thing somewhere. Uh, so we, because of the social media pressure, we changed the name, actually, which went back down, but anyway, I'm diverting slightly. So that was a guy who, who vilified Kant, and all these things came out. You know, you can read that, dope pillars are shrewd, they put some of this in your tea. Uh, killer drug, murder, insanity, and death. So this is the sort of image that began to be common. And that's a very famous film. It's worth seeing. It's still available on YouTube. Um, it's uh, completely daft and totally full of rubbish. But it's entertaining. <laughs> it's entertainingly daft. And that's the sort of thing, and you've probably heard the term reefer man, is that phrase is still around um, in various circles. So, and then, uh, to come up to date, uh, then it was decided by the United Nations uh, that cannabis should be deemed, um, uh, again, a, a not a good product, and it was banned with narcotics. It's not a narcotic, but it was banned with narcotics. That was a result of the, uh, the, the Egyptian delegates standing up at that meeting saying, we think cannabis in Egypt is a source of a great deal of crime. We want it included along with narcotics. And that didn't, nobody saw that coming, so nobody said, don't talk rubbish. And so because of that one delegate standing up and saying that, cannabis was then labelled as a narcotic to be banned under what was called the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And that was adopted worldwide as the United Nations. And that's the thing that has stopped many countries now uh, legalising it. Because actually if you legalise it, you have, you have to go against the current UN Convention. So that was again one historical thing about an Egyptian delegate lying about cannabis for whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, so that's, that's the modern history, and it's only now, really, and really in the last two or three years, maybe the last four years, that things are beginning to change, and now cannabis, I'll come to at the end, is legal in 40, for medical use in 47 countries around the world. And it, pretty well every week, uh, there's another country that falls into line. So it's over the next one to two years, the vast majority of countries will legalise cannabis for medical purposes. There'll be some countries that won't for a while yet, but at the moment it's interesting. Um, New Zealand was quite recent, uh, and this week was St Vincent of the Grenadines. So there's little tiny countries around the world every week, virtually every week, are legalising cannabis for medical purposes. <coughs> Two countries at the moment legalise for recreational general use. Uh, Uruguay was the first, and of course Canada. Canada has legalised it for everything. And I think that will follow. I think it will be probably f five years before it happens in this country. I'm certain it will happen in this country, but I think it's not going to be too soon. Okay, well, how does it work? Very briefly, there's a whole talk again uh, in his own right. Um, it works because we all produce cannabis in our brain and our body, uh, believe it or not. So those who are very much against cannabis, an argument is, well, you're producing it yourself, so what are you against? Uh, and we have all in our, our, throughout our body, not just the brain or the spine, but in other organs like the heart and the bladder and the guts, we have things called cannabinoid receptors. Uh, they're chemicals on which the cannabis binds. And we produce our own chemicals in the brain, and they happen to be called anandamide and 2-AG, that doesn't really matter, but they're very, very similar chemically to cannabis in the plant. So all the plant is doing is interacting with our own cannabis system. And what our own cannabis system does, it's called the endocannabinoid system. I'm sure that's too small, you won't be able to read it, so I'll go through it. Just roughly, what does it do? It does most of its things through the brain and the nervous system. 
And you see, well, if you can read it, it affects memory positively. It affects motor control, that's how you walk and how you coordinate. Uh, it affects pain. It affects the development of the nervous system. Um, it affects temperature, sleep, appetite, even things like social behavior and anxiety. So it's not surprising that taking cannabis has a whole load of different um, positive effects. And it's not, I don't know of any other drug or any other medicine that actually has such diverse effects, not just in the brain, but on the reproductive system, on the bladder, on the guts, a control of cancer. Uh, so the reason it is because this endocannabinoid system is throughout the whole body. So you've just taken the plant or whatever form you take it and interacts with our own cannabis system and has a very widespread effect. That's all it does. I want a quick short cut. Basically, the endocannabinoid system relax, eat, sleep, forget and protect. It's a quick short. I think it's a bit too crude actually, but I'll pinch that from somebody. <laughs> It's relax, eat, sleep, forget and protect, that's what it does. So it's, it has a whole range of things on keeping the body, if you like, stable. Um, so that's how it works. And then the natural plant, I'm sure you're again familiar with this to some extent, has two main parts of the natural plant. THC, I'll come back in more detail, that's the one that's meant to get you high. Uh, but it has also medical benefits as well. And CBD is the other one, which is, doesn't get you high, it actually does a bit, but we'll, we'll pass over that bit. Um, it, it, and the balance between the two is what determines what the medicine does. So you have high THC medicine, high CBD medicine. I'll, come, I'll develop this in a minute. Um, and it's thought, though, and it's now pretty definite, that the whole plant is more effective than the individual components. So you can buy pure CBD oil with nothing else in it at all, or pure THC, with nothing in it at all. Uh, but the, for medical purposes, taking the whole plant is better than those individual components. That's called the entourage effect. I don't think there's any doubt that, that that works. So if you look at a whole plant CBD extract, it works better than a pure CBD. Uh, but there's other things in the plant as well, which I'll come to again in a moment, called terpenes. That thing gives you the smell. Cannabinoids don't smell, it's the terpenes in the plant that smell and give you that characteristic. Uh, some people say it's a little bit sickly, but it depends on which terpenes are in there. Uh, there's, a, there's lemon, and I'll come through that in a moment. And then there's thing called flavonoids in the plant, which also have medical, all these things have medical benefits. Flavonoids give the colour. Some are red, it's a bit purple. That's flavonoids. Um, and you get it, of course, without going into all the botany and things. Most of the cannabinoids are in the flower, in the unfertilised female flower head. Uh, I won't ask, uh, embarrass anyone about who grows it here. But those who do grow it uh, will know you need the, the female flower head. And there's not much cannabinoids in the rest of the plant, in the leaves a little bit, not much in the stems, and certainly nothing in the roots of the seeds. So that's what you need. Um, you need the female flowering head. You take that and you can either you can smoke that in itself, you just dry it and smoke it. Uh, but mainly you would extract the oils from it various extraction techniques uh, and it's mainly for medical purposes I'm talking about here you may use it in the form of an oil or a capsule you can vape it and smoke it but for most medical things across the world it's mainly in the form of oils and capsules um, it comes in two basic forms there's actually three but the two big ones one called cannabis sativa that's meant to give you a effect that's a little bit sort of more stimulating a bit more creative if you like the cannabis indica, which is a bit more sedating, a bit more, it's called couch lock. Uh, it, it, it's more um, relaxing. And the two, that's not pure, there's a lot of overlap, uh, but they're the two main varieties from which the medical cannabis is derived. Um, that's the female flower again, and the cannabis is actually in these little tiny white bits on the, on the top of the plant, they're called trichomes, and they're the things that contain the cannabinoids. You can actually brush those off. Um, it, but it's a better, more efficient way of uh, taking the, the cannabis out and doing that. But you, you can rub your hand over it, and it's sticky. <coughs> Run through a field of cannabis, should you feel like it. Um, <laughs> you'll come up with sticky stuff on you, which is the cannabis. <coughs> Incidentally, in the plant, as, a, as a, an aside, um, the plant itself is not psychoactive. Which for some of you know who smoke it, uh, that you have to heat it to make it active and give you the high. So you, can, you see sometimes films of people 
the, the police suddenly raiding a house full of cannabis plants, they eat, they eat some of it quickly and get high as a result. They don't get high as a result because uh, it's not been heated, called decarboxylated. So if you buy the raw flour, you have to heat it or smoke it, of course, which is also heating it uh, to make it um, active. So I won't go through the deck. So I'm not going to bore you with chemistry, don't panic. I was going to tell you a little bit about the main two main components and a bit about the others. One's called THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's what it looks like, but well, nobody cares to hoot what it looks like, <laughs> I shouldn't think. Uh, and this is what it does. I know the size is too small on the screen, but it's, it's psychoactive, I said. What it mainly does medically is it's painkilling, analgesic. That's its big, a big property. Um, it stops you itching. It actually helps breathing, believe it or not. Bronchodilation, <coughs> a little bit like um, the, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it? I mean, hang it in the for asthma. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, muscle relaxant, so it helps muscle spasm after brain injury or stroke or multiple sclerosis. Like that. It's anti sickness, it's really useful for people with chemotherapy when they're very, very sick in chemotherapy. And it's anti inflammatory, like aspirin. It's 20 times as stronger than aspirin, twice as strong as steroids uh, in terms of its anti inflammatory properties. So, THC in isolation is really very useful. But CBD is equally useful, um, and I should—I come back to it. But CBD, in, um, as we've got here tonight, is legal. It always has been for quite a long time. But CBD in isolation is also anti-anxiety. It's got a calming effect. It's very good at anti-epilepsy, as is THC to an extent, uh, and it's very good for, as an anti-anxiety drug. Calms without. It's also analgesic, just like its cousin THC. It um, helps in cancer, particularly forms of breast cancer. It's also anti-sickness, and it helps bone healing. It reduces severity of stroke and brain injuries, and it's not sedating or not generally psychoactive. So that's another, uh, there's a lot more longer list than this, but it shows you that CBD and THC both have a lot of properties in their own right. But it isn't that simple. Because the plant just doesn't have THC and CBD, it has about 120 cannabinoids related to THC and CBD. All those studied so far have also got medical properties in their own right. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that. I'm not going to bore you too much with this, so don't panic. But there's THC. It's got the A after it, because that's its acidic form. That's the one I mentioned. Uh, if that's not psychoactive, you have to heat it, and the A disappears, and it becomes active. So ignore the A on the end. But these come, there's CBD. There's another one called CBC, kind of the chromine, and they all come from a parent, if you like, CBG, kind of in general. But that's a, there's more than that 120, there's only four on that slide. There's a load of them underneath that, but they're the main ones. It shows you where it all comes from. And if you just take, just randomly, CBG, the parent, that has a positive effect on bladder function, glaucoma, it, it reduces pressure in the eye. It's antibacterial, so you can take it for infections. It stimulates appetite, it's anti-inflammatory, and it's anti-cancer. These, incidentally, are the, the, the recreational varieties that are, relatively speaking, high in CBG. Um, they've got sorts of weird names. What's that, Magic Jordan, Destroyer, and Mickey Cook? <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that are high in CBG. And the, the other one, you remember, CBC, the other one? Just again, an example. Uh, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, it helps acne, it <coughs> helps eczema, as we were asking before. Um, it's meant to help depression, particularly. Um, and then there's another whole pathway with a V in it, same as before, but the V in it called Varine. Um, and they're the same, there's loads of these, because I remember there's 120. The only one I wanted to show you was that one, that the, remember the parent, CBG? It's now got a Varine in it. And that one called Tetrahydrocannabivarine. The best thing about that is appetite suppression. It's probably going to have a very useful <coughs> role in uh, anti-obesity agent very safe, very natural, and stops people getting fat. And helps with control of diabetes. Oh, I'm sure that. There you go. <laughs> Several reasons to take this stuff, and it probably helps with Alzheimer's disease as well, probably. There's lots of probably in this, um, because a lot of this stuff is nearly there, but not totally proven. So, having said all that, I just wanted to illustrate the fact that although we all hear about THC and CBD, there's a load of other stuff. And all those things in a full extract cannabis oil will all add together and help the medical effects. But then, don't forget those things called terpenes. 
And there's about five or six of those. Limoline is the one that gives it a, a lemon smell, not surprisingly. That in its own right is antidepressant and helps it cancer. I won't go as all, well, I think all they all do, but just give you a flavour, as it were. Myrcene, that's the one that makes it gives the hoppy sort of smell. And that's uh, analgesic as well and, and is quite sedating, quite useful. I think, I can't get this right, which is, which is it? Uh, I always forget the one as well. I think it's Myrcene. There's one that's the dogs are trained to detect. Is anyone a greater expert at dog detection cannabis than I am? No, that's good. I can make it all <laughs> the, the, the dogs are trained to smell like terpenes. So if you want to import it through airports and things, what you need to do is get a variety that hasn't got that particular terpene in it. So if you grow an anti, a, a, a cannabis without mercy in it, you can get it through airports and it won't be detected by the sniffer dogs. <laughs> it may be detected by the border guards when, you, when they go through your luggage, but it won't be detected by the sniffer dog. Um, and there's pine, it obviously gives it a pine smell. Um, that one, remember some of these have opposite effects. This one actually impairs memory, makes you a bit more forgetful. Are you recording what I've just said about um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 Put that out. Uh, then there's uh, lavender, local anaesthetic, that one, and there's beta caryophylline. That's the sniffer dog one, don't get part. I knew one of them was, and that makes it smell of cloves. And that protects your stomach and, and, and anti inflammatory. And then there's all those flavonoids I mentioned earlier, which give it its colour. And that's too small to read. Take just one here, the, the red colour. And some cannabis varieties are quite reddish. And that's probably something called quercetine. And that's also anti cancer and anti viral. And viral infections, it helps. Interesting. So you add all those together, there's about 120, as a cannabis, as I said, there's about 100 terpenes, and there's about 50 or 60 flavonoids. And a plant has all those in together. And a whole lot combines to make quite a remarkable uh, medicine. What's next? How do you take it? I'm sure there's many people in the room who know very well how to take it, but I go through it. Medically, we can't recommend smoking. You can't have a doctor stand up and say you should smoke the stuff, despite what the Daily Mail said about me last week. Uh, I did not recommend smoking joints. Um, but um, why do I say that? And the only reason is that you have to, if you smoke a joint, you're burning it at high temperature. And there are tars and carcinogens in cannabis, just as there are in tobacco. Now, it's probably not as dangerous as tobacco because THC is anti-cancer. So you're, you're making the cancer drugs by smoking it, but you're counteracting them by the other stuff in it. So probably the risk of lung cancer from smoking joints is either not at all or much, much less than tobacco. But nevertheless, a better way to take it for medical purposes. Do what you like recreationally, but for medical purposes, there's better ways to take it. And one that's I just like that picture. I always like that picture. It's a great picture. Um, best way is to vape it. Um, the reason for vaping it is you just heat it up, not so much as uh, smoking, but then you get the, the you get the vapor off, like e-cigarettes basically. You get the vapor off, it's less temperature, so you're not burning off the carcinogens. Uh, so you but you are lifting off, if you like, the cannabinoids and the terpenes. And according to the temperature of the vape. And there's some fancy vape things you can buy now, I'm sure you know, that you can adjust the temperature. Mm. So you get a particular cannabis, and depending on what you've got in it and what you want out of it, you can adjust the temperature on the vape machine, and that gives you a different combination of uh, um, cannabinoids and terpenes. So it's, it's even more complicated than that. What you get from one product is not the same thing. It depends entirely on how, what you do with it. So there's vaping, there's some very upmarket vape machines these days as well. That's the original, <laughs> that's the original vape machine or the original smoker. <laughs> um, then there's all sorts of other ways of taking You can spray it and there's a, a, a licensed drug called Sativex that you take for multiple sclerosis muscle spasms. That's a, a spray, a spray in your mouth. Um, you can eat it, of course, and edibles in this country, all these things I'm going through are now legal except smoking. So a doctor could prescribe an edible for you. I think it'll be a while before they do, uh, but you can, you can put, as you know, you can put cannabis as your own, um, the cannabis stuff at the back there, if you haven't got, if you've got CBD in there, you don't have, you don't, you don't sell edibles. No. No, no. 
target for you then. <laughs> um, so, and now, of course, in the countries where it's more advanced, and it's mainly Canada, there's a lot of different edible forms of taking cannabis. And the advantage of doing that is it's longer lasting. If you take an edible, uh, it kicks in between 30 minutes and two hours, depending on what you take and how you take it, and then it, but it then lasts six or eight hours, roughly. The disadvantage, if you don't know that, you take it an hour later, nothing's happened, so you take a bit more. And, uh, and, and, you know, two or three hours later, you're totally spaced out. Uh, but nevertheless, if you want some, a longer lasting effect, like people with pain or overnight, then taking an edible is very useful because it will last longer. Whereas if you vape it or smoke it, um, then of course the effect is much more instant, but it will only last an hour or so. Some people use both combinations of oils and capsules and, and uh, vaping, so they want an immediate effect, but they also want on the background of a longer lasting effect. So one thing is not necessarily right for everybody. Uh, people might need a combination of all these different bits and pieces. Uh, you can put it in oils and capsules and creams, suppositories. I haven't got a few supreme picture on here. You should have given me one. Where are <laughs> so, that's how you take it, that's how it grows, and that's how it works. Very briefly, again, there's a whole talk on the evidence behind it. That's what I did for the government thing. Um, and it's, a, it's going to be illegal. There's an awful lot of evidence out there. Well, we looked at 20,000 studies, and that was three years ago. And the number of studies has now doubled in the last three years. So the, the academic studies produced in the previous 30 or 40 years has doubled in the last three years. So it's the curve of the publications going up like that. So now it's more legal, therefore more readily available to study. Uh, we're understanding a lot more about it much, much more quickly. <coughs> Bear in mind this evidence we looked at three years ago, but what we found, there was good evidence for uh, five things, ladies. Good evidence for pain. No doubt, absolutely no doubt that it helps pain. And that's any sort of pain, it's arthritic pain, cancer pain, nerve pain, uh, fibromyalgia type pain. Um, extraordinarily, when the, the government asked uh, two bodies to produce recommendations, one was the Royal College of Physicians and one was the British Pediatric Neurology Association, the, British, the Royal College of Physicians said there's not enough evidence to you make you recommend its use in pain. It's why difficult for doctors to get it. That's against all evidence. Uh, it's not just me, there's an uh, American body called the National Academies of Science, it's an Australian body, an Irish body, all said the same thing. Our own chief medical officer said it was useful for pain, and the Royal Constitution said it isn't. And for God knows why. Anyway, there's no doubt, no doubt, uh, that it helps chronic pain. And that's what mainly 80% of people in medical clinics in Canada, for example, uh, are people with pain, in various shapes and forms. So 80% of the use of medical cannabis is for various painful conditions. It doesn't stop there, it helps spasticity. And we've got a legal product that I showed you earlier called Sativex, been around for about 10 years, that is, helps muscle spasm. That's, that's very common, as I'm sure you have some of your relatives or something, but after a stroke, you get tight muscles, uh, multiple sclerosis, brain injury, spinal injury, you get muscle spasms, spasticity as it's called, and they, Cannabis can relax the muscles and help the pain that goes with that muscle spasm sometimes. That's two things. The third was sickness in chemotherapy. That has any of you had relatives with chemotherapy for cancer? Um, that is <coughs> really quite very debilitating and it helps that extraordinarily. It can stop sickness after chemotherapy. In children as well, it's particularly useful. Uh, and nausea in other circumstances, it may be very useful for that thing in pregnancy called hyperemesis gravidarum, uh, where people are sick for nine months. My daughter was out and they have to have very powerful drugs, which are not good in pregnancy. So I can't really, you shouldn't recommend any cannabis or any drug in pregnancy, but if you really need something, then probably cannabis is quite good for that, because it's probably safe from the really powerful drugs that um, pregnant women have to have at the moment. There's 20, no less than 23 controlled studies confirming that. So uh, this is not flimsy stuff at all. Um, anxiety, I mentioned earlier, that's just CBD though. Uh, not the THC, THC can make you more anxious. Not always, but sometimes. So it can help anxiety, stress if you like. It can calm people down. Some people just use it for that, they find it very helpful. 
And the other one, I didn't put in the report, but I would add now, because I'm sure you've known all the publicity about the little children with epilepsy, people like Alfie Dingley, <coughs> Billy Cordwell, and the others are all in the press. They're the people largely responsible for changing the law in this country. Um, and they have had a remarkable improvement with CBD. Uh, I can tell you about Alfie, but his mother was quite happy for me to talk about him. He had about 300 seizures a month. 300 seizures a month. Um, that went down on all drugs, nothing helped at all. Every known anticonvulsant. He then went on to CBD product, and it reduced by half, 50% less. So 150 seizures a month. That was still an awful lot, but notice it's 50% better than it was before. And then he added a tiny little bit of THC into that, and it stopped his seizures and had none since June. Uh, so it is extraordinary. I mean, okay, he's perhaps a, a brilliant example, and not, I'm not gonna say it works like that for everybody, but it works like that for most people. Maybe not curing like Alfie, or uh, stopping like Alfie, but at least a, a good 80, 90% improvement, often with that little bit of THC added. And that's not enough in any remote shape or size to get people, little children high. A, because the dose is very small, and B, because it's counteracted by the CBD. CBD counteracts the high of THC. So if you take a, something with THC in it, by itself it can make you a bit high, but if you add CBD in it, it <coughs> take Sativex, the drug I mentioned earlier, that's 50% THC. That's massively potent. But it's counteracted by 50% CBD, and Sativex doesn't make you high at all. So CBD counteracts that effect. Um, and probably, in fact, I would go as far as say certainly now, the full extract product called FICO, full extract cannabis oil, is better than the pure products. Then we've got moderate evidence. There's other things, I won't go through these, but how we define moderate evidence at the moment. But there's pretty good evidence, but not as solid as the other things, for stimulating appetite, as useful for some people, particularly the studies we've done in HIV, wasting conditions like in cancer and things helping sleep, helping fibromyalgia, and helping PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, again, part of his anxiety effect. There was a bit of evidence for some effects in dementia, for bladder problems, for Tourette's, which you may have heard of some of these things, for glaucoma, and some aspects of um, Parkinson's disease. And then we couldn't make a recommendation because there wasn't enough evidence. It doesn't mean it doesn't work for these things. It means the studies haven't been done might not work for these things. But actually take depression, the second commonest cause of cannabis use in this country for medical reasons is for depression. And I would suggest that if, if there are tens of thousands of people using it for depression, it probably does something, otherwise they wouldn't be bothering. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, there's not surprisingly few studies on depression, won't go through all these, and a lot of people use it for Crohn's disease, and also colitis. Some people find it remarkable for that, but the studies haven't yet been done to, make, to be firm about it. Um, cancer is the big one in the press. As I said already, many of the cannabinoids are definitely anti-cancer in animal models. You sadly believe it, whether you like it or not, in a sense. Uh, you give mice various cancers, and you give them um, those cannabinoids, and the cancers get cured, or at least helped. And there's many examples of, of anecdotal examples of people being cured of cancer by taking cannabis. There's, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's going to help all cancers by any stretch of imagination, but for some specific cancers it probably does help. And we shouldn't forget the wellness side of it. If you have cancer, you might have disturbed sleep, you might have poor appetite, you might be in pain, you might have muscle spasm, um, as, and it helps all those things. So there's a sort of wellness quality of life. Even if it does nothing to your cancer, it may help your your. Um, Life. Quality of life. Quality of life, that's the way. Thank you. Okay. A quick thing, of course, I feel supreme. Um, better explain, some people don't know the difference between hemp and, and <coughs> uh, cannabis and CBD. Hemp is cannabis. It's cannabis sativa. It's, it, you tell me if I'm wrong here about anything, because you know about it. hemp more than I do. But the hemp is cannabis. <coughs> so don't be deceived about that. But it's a cannabis that's been grown over many years to produce, basically, it's been um, produced for its um, non-medical qualities, and over the centuries people used it for paper, uh, for uh, animal bedding, uh, for hempcrete, which builds houses. Mm -hmm. One of the early 
cars by Henry Ford was made purely out of hemp. Uh, it's a remarkable product, but it also is grown just to have CBD, or virtually only CBD, tiny, tiny amounts of the other cannabinoids. So hemp-based products are illegal and available in, in shops like here and uh, Holland and Barrett and Healthspan. Uh, the hemp-based CBD is CBD. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If it comes from hemp or the proper cannabis plant. It's CBD. Uh, but it doesn't have much of the other cannabinoids in. That's the only real difference. Um, illegally it can sell it if it's got less than 0.2 percent of THC. Um, which the Holland and Barrett varieties and things usually have, although there's some evidence that they that varies a bit quality-wise, that they can have sometimes a little bit higher than that. But generally, they shouldn't have more than 0.2% um, THC. So that's hemp. And that's a, you won't see that tiny, but it just shows you what hemp's been used for over the centuries. The seeds, <coughs> hemp seeds are very healthy. Um, the hemp oil, you've got to look at it carefully at the bottle. If it says hemp oil, um, or sometimes it says cannabis oil, but it hasn't necessarily got any cannabinoids in it. It's just the hemp seed oil, which is very healthy, but it hasn't got any cannabinoids in it. So you've got to look very carefully what's on the bottle of all these products, because there's a load of them around now. Um, and remember, hemp seed does not have uh, cannabinoids in <coughs> Where we got? Dose, if anyone's taken it or tried to take it, I have to read this out because it's too small. The basic problem is to start low and go slow. That's a thing. CBD, you need a little bit, so always start low. You probably need, you know, the full extract, you need about two to 300 milligrams, roughly, as an average. But some, you can go much higher, this is for some people. The pure isolates I mentioned earlier need much higher doses. They don't work as well, they need much higher doses. THC, you just need perhaps a milligram or two milligrams. Of course, for some conditions like pain, you go around 20 milligrams. So how much you need is better medically for me to think in milligrams rather than the particular varieties like Hindu Kush or whatever I mentioned earlier. Um, it's better to, for me to think in milligram dosages. And for you, it's probably better if you think about it medically. Look on the bottle and it should say how many milligrams per drop, how many milligrams per mil, and then you can work out exactly what you're taking. And you know that. 20 milligrams does this, so I need a bit more. It's far better to work like that, being a bit rigid and almost mathematical or arithmetical about it, than just guessing from uh, the particular strain you can buy. Um, it does depend a bit on how you take it. I think all the bioavailability is more. You put it under your tongue, you get about half of the dose into the body system. Um, if you take it as under the tongue, if you just swallow it, you only get about 15 to 20% of what's in the bottle. So you've got to think, it's not as easy as saying this bottle is 20 milligrams. Well, it doesn't matter what I do with it. It depends how much you get in the body. It depends on the way you take it. So it's not that straightforward, actually. Um, what's it do? We've got to talk about its side effects. And they're very minor, actually. CBD, I can't say no side effects, because it does. But they're really very mild indeed. Um, the vast majority of people taking CBD have no real side effects, I think you'd agree with that. It's pretty safe. THC a bit more, and THC can make it the four Ds there, dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth and disorientation, and of course the high that goes with it. And some, remember that's not necessarily a side effect, some people want the high, they want to, they want to get that feeling, which can be a medical um, benefit as well for some people, but for most not. So they're the short term things, but remember they're short term. Um, and of course it goes after a couple of hours or about six or eight hours of an edible, it's gone. So I'm not going to minimise those. Some people just don't like high THC products, for example. What people are worried about the press, particularly Daily Mail, is worried about are uh, the long-term effects. And does cannabis cause schizophrenia or psychosis? Uh, and the answer is yes, it does. We don't have any doubt. It does, but it's the high THC street cannabis that does that, generally speaking. Not medical cannabis, because I already said, medical cannabis, generally speaking, is lower in THC and it's counteracted by the CBD. Uh, so I go around the corner of the street and get 20, 25%, 30% uh, THC, which the press tend to call skunk, that's not very accurate, but that's what they call it. Um, that can give you mental health issues if you're prone to them. If you have a family history of psychosis or you've had schizophrenia yourself, then it's probably best avoided. The chances, though, I think this is a lovely paper here, 
that showed to stop one episode of psychosis, you had to stop 10,000 male light users from smoking it or taking it. And 29,000 light female users. We need to stop cannabis to prevent one case of schizophrenia. And I've got to minimize the, the, mm. that one case, uh, but nevertheless, it puts it into context. If you're taking a you know, one in 29,000 chance, most people will probably take that chance. So the fact that you're going to go dotty on the street because you smoke some cannabis is utter nonsense. Um, what else does it do? Can you, get, you can get dependent on it. Not, it's not addictive. It's not addictive. But you get it dependent. That means that about 9% of people, compare that to alcohol, 15% um, of tobacco, 32%. So again, those with cannabis dependency syndrome, it's a problem for them. They don't like to stop and they get a bit anxious when they do try and stop. So I'm not going to minimise its problems, but again, it's the street cannabis, high THC, that does that. You do not get dependent on CBD. It doesn't cause you the high, it's not psychoactive, so you can't. Driving, you shouldn't really drive if you're high on cannabis, to say the obvious. Again, that's THC. Um, does it cause lung cancer? I mentioned that already. Uh, probably not. Does it reduce memory? Yeah, I mean, THC can impair your memory while you're high on THC. You won't be remembering things. Your cognition um, will be a bit less. You'll be a bit confused, maybe, but cause concentration, poor memory. Does it do that in the long term? And again, it might, there's a little bit of evidence that some people can have impaired cognition in the long term, but again, it's high THC street cannabis that does that, if anything does it. So again, I don't want to minimise the problems, but they're generally, generally, the problems of street cannabis, recreational cannabis, and not medical cannabis. Um, I think I'm really only to mention opioid. I'm sure you've read in the press, particularly in the States, problems of opioid overdosage. People die every year. In this country, in the, in the States, 64,000 people died of an opioid overdose last year. <coughs> in 2016, rather. It's less in this country, or well, the population is less, but the incidence is less, but it's probably several, it's either several thousand people <coughs> die every year from an opioid overdosage, either deliberately or accidentally, because it suppresses your respiration, and if you're particularly if you're elderly, you take a bit too much, you forget the number of tablets you take, you stop breathing. Um, if, you take, if you're taking it for pain, you can spare the dosage of opioids by taking cannabis. Sometimes you can stop all together, um, but basically overall, about 25% of those deaths are saved. So in the United States, you would save something in the order of 16,000 deaths a year by introducing cannabis. Now that in its own right is probably worth doing. Mm -hmm. You should remember that no one ever in recorded history has died of a cannabis overdosage. You can't die of a cannabis overdosage. Um, someone worked out, I thought what the figure was, you needed to smoke 32,000 joints through the space of an hour. <laughs> Some bright spot in the audience said, I don't, I don't want to try that. Uh, but uh, you can't, basically can't die. But the reason is that there's no cannabinoid receptors in the brainstem, and the brainstem controls the breathing. Uh, so you can't die of a cannabis overdosage, but you can die of an opioid overdose. That's worth remembering for the politicians, I think. Okay, last couple of slides before I shut up. Um, where are we in the UK now at the moment? I don't necessarily bother to read this, I'll read it out. But, yeah, cannabis, you can prescribe a doctor, a specialist doctor, a doctor on the specialist register, that means a hospital consultant, generally speaking, um, can prescribe can a cannabis medicine. For any condition, any condition, there's no, we have now the most liberal cannabis regime in Europe, extraordinarily, particularly for this government. I would, never would have believed that even six months ago. For any condition, uh, any cannabis medicine um, a doctor can prescribe in any, any format except smoking, as I said earlier. That's remarkable, really. Um, so these are some of the actual regulations. Uh, I won't bore you with that, I don't think. It, but basically, uh, also not widely known, a GP can actually prescribe cannabis under the direction of a doctor on a specialist register. So they have to be told what to do, but nevertheless it is legal for a GP to do it. That's very unknown, but that is definitely the correct interpretation. Um, so the problem we've got is, of course, 
that the vast majority of doctors won't prescribe it. Um, the vast majority. We don't think there's yet been an NHS prescription written since it became legal in November. There have been about six prescriptions written, all in the private sector. There's still some of them that don't agree that it's legal. Mine in yeah, particular. There's a, there's a lot of nonsense about, there's a lot of ignorance about. Some won't prescribe for good reason, <coughs> they don't understand what to prescribe. And they've never been taught about it. So, you know, fair enough. As I said earlier, well, we wouldn't, I wouldn't want my doctor to prescribe something for me, didn't know what he was talking about, or she. Um, but we can get over that. We've set up this academy thing. We've got a now doctor source cannabis society. So education will happen over the next one to two years. So that group of people who are okay with it, but don't want to prescribe it because they don't understand it, they will be converted. But there's still this rump, generally the senior doctors, people at the Royal College of Physicians, who just, for whatever reason, don't like it, don't prescribe it, make up all sorts of things, I can't use it for that condition, or it's a limited number we can do, we're not gonna pay for it, and all sorts of rubbish is taught. But basically, it's any doctor on the specialist register can prescribe for any condition. And preferably, if you've got, say, a bowel problem, you'd like a bowel doctor to prescribe for you, but that, even that's not necessary. You mean, you could have a, an obstetrician prescribing for, a gynecologist could prescribe for epilepsy, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, as long as you're on the specialist register, that's all that actually matters. Um, so, nearly finished. Yeah, of course we need more stuff, we need a lot more work to do. This is not finished, this is new. Uh, we need more studies to show what dose to give, what method of ingestion is best, for what condition, uh, how much should we use, what should we use, what type should we use, loads of stuff we need to know about. But what we have to do, and we now have done, so the pressure is not that needs to be on the government, it needs to be on the doctors. We need to legalise it to stop criminalising people with disabilities. But we make a promote knowledge, generate, and it generates income. Okay, but if you, even if you like that, you can tax the stuff. Um, and help, literally, it's about three million people every day use cannabis in this country. One million of those use it for medical purposes. Two million for recreational, a bit of overlap, of course. Uh, so one million people a day are still, except six, are still using it illegally. And I think that's sad in many ways. So, I've done, what I like to see is that's a picture of Canada. It's like an apple shop, isn't it? And that's, a, <laughs> it's a curb, that's a cannabis dispensary. The people running called bud tenders, which I love that phrase, uh, are very knowledgeable. As I'd like to see that here in Liverpool or Manchester and Birmingham. So you go in and you discuss things openly, but the people know what they're talking about and you get the right cannabis for your particular condition. And I don't think it has to be doctors that do it personally. Mm -hmm. I think it could be people who know what they're doing. And after people who know what they're doing, are generally the people who've been on the criminal markets for many years, because mm -hmm. they've grown the bloody stuff. Yeah. The best growers I've come across, by far, are those who've been growing it illegally. Of course they have been, uh, for many years. Um, even our favorite politician, has said, Mario, I can't do his accent. Marijuana is such a big thing, I think medical should happen. Don't we agree? I think so. I mean, he hasn't done anything about it yet. He <laughs> probably did it at three o'clock in the morning and forgotten he'd done it. But nevertheless, <laughs> even he, uh, <laughs> and he should join the ranks of his previous presidents who were stoners like George Bush. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you think children with um, ADHD or autism will benefit from it? Uh, yeah, there's some evidence now. For the last uh, mm -hmm. few year, the last year really, we've got 18 months, that there should, early studies have shown ADHD benefits. Yes. We don't know much about what sort, what type. Again, one of those on that list I put out earlier, yeah. there's a limited evidence now. I, would add, I don't think it was on that list actually, but I, I think we should add it on that list now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is there any evidence that interacts with other medications? Yes. Um, very little. Um, the two one, I mean, there's lots and lots of drugs that te theoretically interacts with things like antifungal agents and things, which are not that important. The big one, the big two are warfarin, for the blood thinning, mm -hmm. which people take it for stroke sometimes or, or heart problems. It does mix with that. You've got to make, you, you can monitor the warfarin levels in the blood. You have to monitor them carefully for on cannabis. Um, and the other one is the children's uh, clobazam anticonvulsant. It increases levels of clobazam. So if your child is on clobazam, 
you need to monitor the clobazam levels and probably make a modest reduction in the dose. They're the two main ones. There's a long list of others, but generally speaking, it mixes very well with pretty well everything. But you need to, I can't, I can't say that in a blanket way, mm -hmm. but it's, um, it's very safe, basically. Yeah. So if you were to implant form in the future, say we, we embrace it and for five years in the future, could you actually take a part of our plant and then juice it down with properties such as like all broccoli and spinach and get the benefits that way so you can buy up and drink it? Yes. Yeah, yeah so I've got a few slides that we call it Dulux medicine cannabis. Yeah. Uh, that you, you can now take out of not just cannabis, other plants, the, those terpenes and things I mentioned earlier, and the cannabinoids particularly. And what I think we'll understand more in the next four or five years is for that particular you and your particular condition, you're likely to need this, 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 and this, and you just mix them together as a personalized medicine. Now that may be a bit far-fetched, uh, because if you take uh, pain in Canada, for example, most of the providers produce about five types. High CBD, high THC, and about three in between. And in Canada, about 20% of people respond well to each one of those. In other words, so you can't, I don't think we'll ever get to a point where you say, for your particular pain, this is what you need. But you could, what I think we will get is your particular pain, this is the, says the best chance of helping. But if that doesn't help, try this one and this one and this one, and we'll get much better at personalizing it. And some of those other things, you're quite right, are in other plants, in broccoli and in tomatoes. But it's all in cannabis, so in a sense, why would we bother? Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it is in those other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot, five years' time, we're going to look back on this and think, what the hell was all the fuss about? Um, yeah. Is there likely to be any standardization <coughs> of the information which comes out for this type of stuff? So if you were to set up a dispensary that you had, you yeah. know, clear guidelines as to how to... I wish to there was. The uh, there's, there's the Cannabis Trade Association that I don't know that much about, but that's, mm. they're trying to set those standards, but that's just for the CBD market. Okay. I hope. Um, over time, well, well, we've got a thing now called the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society that's about to produce guidance. That the guidance is written actually. Clinician Society. Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. Thank you. It's not out yet, but in the next two to three weeks, their guidance will be out mainly for doctors. Uh, but I think over time, yeah, if you want to set up a, a dispensary or something, as it will be possible, there will be clear guidance and regulations, quite rightly, that go with it. Is there an idea, you know, the, the breed and all the growing of the, the plant? Yeah. Was there a reason why they did not extract the full THC yeah. from the CBD? Or was that done on purpose? Uh, the company, the particular company called GW Farm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because they were going, I understand why, I don't agree with it, but I understand why. They went down the pharmaceutical route. If you're developing a pharmaceutical medicine, you need one chemical compound, but you try out in those famous double-blind placebo-controlled studies, as they call them, for one condition. So they got their product called Salivex licensed just for resistant spasticity and multiple sclerosis. So they went down the pharmaceutical route, and they got it approved. We were well done with them. They were 10 years ahead of the rest. Um, but, but you can't really license a pharmaceutical, as a pharmaceutical medicine, a full extract cannabis product, because it contains, as I've said, you know, all the different bits and pieces, all the terpenes and flavonoids, it's not consistent uh, for that standard pharmaceutical group. And that's why they like the why, 0.02 That's why they've got, yeah, they've got the pure isolates. They yeah. do work, but they do not work as well as the full plant. And even GW Pharma now admit to that. Um, but they had to go down that route if they wanted to get a license as medicine. Yeah. And these are not licensed medicines, they're unlicensed medicines. A doctor can prescribe anything. Uh, but it's unlicensed, so the doc that's another re reason why they're a bit reluctant, is they would have to take personal responsibility. If you prescribe a licensed medicine and something goes wrong, you can sue the company that makes it. If you try an unlicensed medicine that goes wrong, you sue the doctor that gets it. <coughs> a lot of doctors don't want to be sued. Mm. Mm. Okay. Tonya mentioned before about the four plants are extra expensive, obviously. Uh, and you said it was the cannabis that I had, not the hemp. Yeah, uh, see, my lads with epilepsy, uh, I use CBD and THC. So I'm getting my doses right for the ratios. Yeah. Uh, so would cannabis be better than hemp for them? 
Well, hemp, as a CBD and hemp is perfectly good um, for epilepsy, for a lot of people. And because it's from hemp, it's still CBD, it's the same chemical. It's just that hemp doesn't have all the other, much, much of the other stuff in it. So probably for most children with epilepsy, not all, but most, you need to start with CBD only. And that, some people that's fine, that's all you need. But others you need a small bit of THC added in. But the ratio is probably something like one or two to 100. So if you take 100 milligrams of CBD, you need one to two milligrams of THC. So I've been doing it, I've been doing like a 10 mil syringe. I've actually been giving them suppositories. I found that they've been working yeah, better. Yeah, perfectly well. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing like 10 mil CBD and then two mil THC, so it's well too much, isn't it? Uh, well, it depends. The trouble with mills, it depends what the concentration is. So it's, it's about 2 to 100 in milligrams. So 2 milligrams of THC to every 100 milligrams of CBD. So it depends what the concentration is in the actual bottle. So that might be fine, but it depends on actually how many milligrams of the chemical are actually giving. That's the, that's the key to it. So you roughly, very roughly, you need about 2 to 100. Some would say 4 to 100, but it's of that order. 1, 2, 3, 4 to 100 is the best ratio. Has he right. improved at all? Yeah, I gave him THC at first and improved after that. And then I gave him CBD that way. And then when I done them together, he stopped mm -hmm. for eight weeks. But then I'm looking into it and you can like flood the system, can't you? Yeah, so it he seems to stop, start, stop, start. So yeah, it takes up right. to about six weeks to settle down as well, four to six weeks after changing dose for the new level to become clear. Because some people change too early or give up too soon or mm -hmm. add things too soon. You just yeah, need to start something, keep it going for at least four weeks, make it up if you can, uh, and then assess that and then make a quick adjustment. It's, yes. the trouble is most people haven't discovered this for